Welcome to The Rest is Politics, special edition with me, Rory Stewart. And me, Alistair Campbell. And this is, I think you said, I think I agree with you, the week that everything changed. But do you want to tell us why this is the week that everything changed? Well, two big things. The first is, I think that Keir Starmer found his voice and found confidence. And I think confidence is such an important thing in any campaign, but especially in politics. And I think he has at times lacked confidence, but I think he showed, I think he just, you just sensed he was confident. He thinks he can win. The second thing is that it comes at the time where the Tories are losing confidence, particularly in Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng. And of course, the markets have completely lost confidence, which is then just sending the whole thing into a vicious spiral, both economically and politically. There's an amazing, um, amazing kind of combination of things happening, isn't there? Um, I think Raphael Barron, the Guardian, put it put it quite nicely because the the budget he said seemed to be the most extraordinary combination of destroying any claims of the Conservative Party to economic credibility, and at the same time focusing on a narrative that they're just out there to help their wealthy friends. I mean, it was almost the worst of all worlds that you could possibly do with a Conservative budget. And you, uh, I know, are in, in Jordan, so you may not have had the pleasure that those of us in this country have had of listening to what I think will go down in history as on a par with Prince Andrew's Pizza Express interview in terms of a disastrous media round. And in fact, somebody has just reminded me that one of Liz Truss's media advisors was formerly an advisor to Prince Andrew. So, so just, just, just quickly, for, for listeners, listeners in other parts of the world, what's happened is Liz Truss, having been in silence, um, uh, people were joking that she had become the prime ministerial equivalent of a, an answering sheen message saying, this is the number 10 <laughs> switchboard, somebody will get back to you shortly. And then she decided that what she was going to do is not go out on the national media, so not be interviewed by the BBC or ITV or Channel 4, but instead to go out on local radio stations in particular. And and she did an incredible number, didn't she? She did sort of, I, I think I saw 10 or a dozen different local radio mm. stations, one after another that she was doing. Um, and it, as you say, it was a disaster. But before we get on to the disaster, why was she doing that? What was, if you were the comms director, what would be the normal justification for why you'd be doing local radio, not national? Well, the thing, there's this thing. If I did one of these the other day to promote the TV program that I'm doing with Saida, Saida Wilsey, and I basically, you go along, do you probably done it? You go along to, the, to a studio. Um, you sit there in front of a microphone, you have headphones on, you put a message out on something called the GNS within the BBC, and regional stations can bid for time, and you maybe do, you know, you can do it. I've done, I once did when I had a book out, I did like 25 of them in a row. You do about five minutes, you just go back to back. And the thinking behind doing it in normal circumstances is that you're, you know, you're showing respect to the regional media and therefore to the people who are listening to those stations. But politically, at this stage, why you would do this when you are being criticised by your MPs, by the markets, by your uh, ministers, by the media, you're criticised for avoiding it. I think they probably did it, the same as Johnson used to do this, where you go out and basically they think they can get an easier ride. And it's almost always a mistake. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the assumption, isn't it? So what they say is... Real people in inverted commas, and a lot of the talk in politics is always about real people. So real people in inverted commas listen to local radio. They trust local radio. They're not interested in the echo chamber of national media and all the chat around Westminster. So let's get to the real people. We can have an honest conversation with that. We'll get our message out. We'll reconnect with our base. And we're not going to have to worry about being attacked on the Today program. That's the kind of theory, right? And it is, That is the theory, but it's also incredibly naive because once you're the prime minister, the fact that you're doing an interview with Radio Tees or Radio Leeds or Radio Lancashire, the whole of the media is listening because you're the prime minister. And so what's been happening today is the whole of the national media and people like me have been following these interviews. And I actually said, I said, this isn't me just being wise after the event. I tweeted before, when I heard she was doing it, I, I did a tweet this morning saying, car crash incoming because she's doing what Johnson used to do, thinking you'll get an easy ride. Do you remember that extraordinary interview he had with STV? That he did a round of regional television interviews, and he got absolutely destroyed by a woman from STV. And today, Radio Lancashire, my favourite so far, Radio Lancashire, where you can actually hear her aides slipping her pieces of paper 
in these long gaps where guess what she was asked about in Lancashire? Fracking. Yeah, well, who would have thought she was going to get asked about but fracking? If she'd listened to our podcast. One of the problems, she's boycotting our podcast because she would have had all the facts at her fingertips, wouldn't she? <laughs> and then Radio Stoke, where the presenter, John Akers, I promise you, if you listen back to it, he knows more about the workings of the economy and the impact of interests, interest rates and inflation than the Prime Minister. That's quite worrying. Well, presumably, Alistair, it's logically the case that actually it's an incredibly dangerous thing to do because for every single one of those journalists, it is the biggest moment in their career to date. They will put an unbelievable amount of preparation into it, and they're going to bring their A game to it. And you're going in every five minutes into another journalist whose entire career is riding on being able to trip you up and take you down. And probably it's safer to go with the Today program where they've got out of bed at four in the morning and they're worrying about other stuff before they interview you. Well, and also, also, you know how it works and you know the formula. Look, I think we've got an extraordinary combination here with Liz Truss. We've talked a little bit about this before. I think she is utterly devoid of empathy. I don't think she has any understanding of human beings. Um, she's robotic in her style. I don't actually think she's very clever, I'm afraid. And I think that she's got an extraordinary arrogance. So the fact that today she kept saying, this is the right plan for the future. And they kept saying, well, that's all very well, but our mortgages are going tits up. Our pensions are going tits up. The pound is tanking. And she kept just saying, well, it'll be tough through the winter, but then we had Ukraine. And people started to pull their hair out. What are you talking about? And I just, so I think, I think that we've got a, look, the Tory party, your old party, Rory, they're going to have to get a grip of this, but how they, my, I'm putting down an early marker on this. If they get rid of her, which they're going to have to, there has to be a general election. The idea of trusting this effing Tory party to foist another prime minister on the country is utterly unacceptable. That's what they're going to try and do. She's dead. She's toast. One, one thing I've been thinking about, um, which comes out of our conversations in the past and your, your great hero, Moses Naim, who obviously we need to interview on the podcast to talk about Moises, populism. Moises, Moises, Moises. Populism, populism <laughs> post-truth and, and uh, polarization. Um, why is it that the world is now producing figures like Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng? And I think there's a sort of structural thing that we're only just beginning to become aware of. One of them is that the world somehow is accelerating. The leaders we're producing are getting younger and younger. So as far as I remember, you know, Tony Blair was the youngest prime minister for 200 years and David Cameron was the youngest prime minister for 200 years, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But also that we're into a world where Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng really like to throw out very, very defensive one sentence, provocative sound bites. You know, they will say, obviously what we need to do is cut taxes. We need to cut expenditure. And when you try, and this is true on a human level, when I was with them in parliament, try to stop them and say, but, but Quasi, how's that going to work out? Or Liz, but if we cut 25% of this department, we're going to have the problem, problems in the national parks, et cetera. I'd have these conversations. They don't want to sit down. They don't want to have those kinds of conversations. There's a sort of attention deficit disorder. And my theory, says he come to the end of his pompous idea, is that something about the modern world and social media and the pace at which things operate kind of favor or have favored politicians with this sort of attention deficit disorder, the lack of empathy, the lack of time to mull over things, admit they might be wrong, look at the complexities of things, that something about our culture favors these people. And then, of course, puts them in positions where what was their strength in getting elected becomes their weakness in governing, because, of course, you can't run a country like that. I mean, I think there's something in that, but I think that is because they are driven by the pressures that that new world creates in the wrong direction. Now, I'm assuming that even you, Rory, have heard of Arsene Wenger. Arsene Wenger. I actually, I really like Arsene Wenger. I'm well, a real really, admirer and, and you've of heard Arsene of Wenger. Okay. I've, and, well, not, me, and I've actually met him. And I, I actually good. I re really like well, I, him. I, I, I've met him many times, and it's probably a story for another day. I've even been around a, a Waitrose supermarket with him buying vegetables. Does he like the mange too? It doesn't matter what he likes. Uh, <laughs> but he, he, he basically said, I think I may have told you this before, he said that all the pressures of the modern world, because of the pace of things like social media and 24-7 news and so forth, all the pressures are to be tactical. And the response should be to be more strategic. And I completely and totally, one million percent agree with that. And I think that we do have to, within the British context, so for example, Moises Naim, 
who you just mentioned, we probably mentioned him more than any other living being on this podcast, but um, he wrote a piece for the New European a few months ago where he actually did say that he thought that Britain and Brexit was the really big surprise. He thinks that the world has been surprised that Britain has gone down this populist, polarizing, post-truth route because he thought that our institutions were so respected and so seen as being so strong around the world. But I think the thing that dr helps to drive it in that direction in our country, I'm afraid, is our mainstream media. You still have, even in this week, you have had papers like The Express, papers like The Mail, papers like The Telegraph. That guy, I can't even remember his name, there's this guy at The Telegraph whose his big line is, you know, Liz Truss must stick to her guns. Do you think that's Alistair somebody? Is Alistair, it Alistair Heath. Alistair yeah, Heath, that's the one. Yeah. And then you've got the male just sort of, you know, which is literally a kind of, and I use my words carefully, it literally is like something out of 1930s Germany in terms of anything the government says, they're basically behind it. Now, so you have this, that, that produces, if you have, this is why I keep saying, Rory, you disagreed, you pushed back on this earlier in the week. The reason why I keep saying that if this was a Labour government, this is how they'd be being treated. Because let's face it, if any objective judgment was being made of the effect that Kwasi Kwarteng has had on our economy, on our living standards, on our country in the last two weeks, he would be out of a job. If this was a Labour Chancellor, well, no, but, he'd be but, out but, of a job he, by but now. He is, but he is basically out of a job. I mean, to, I mean, I don't think it's that there's been a conspiracy. No, he's not. He's not. He's at the Treasury. He's at the yeah, Treasury now, but, today. I don't think it's a conspiracy of the media to say he's doing a great job. Uh, the, entire, not, the entire country thinks he's doing a rubbish job. No, but I mean, this no guy, Rory, you're missing my this point. This guy, Alistair Heath in The Telegraph, you're right, is a lunatic who's produced a headline saying this budget will go down in history. But he's like one voice out of a thousand. No, but Rory, you're missing the point I'm making. Yesterday... Trust, we will build a world-beating economy. That was the front page of the Daily Express. The, the, even the Times, by the way, barely covered Keir Starmer's speech. Now, fair enough, they might have been because they thought the Tory story, the government story is more important. But my point is, I think this does play into this. But this is not just structural. I mean, remember David Cameron complained when he was running against you or William Hague complained. Remember in our interview with William Hague? Yeah. That you can never get any coverage as the leader of the opposition. That's it's not true. Incre incredibly different. That was what Haig was saying all the way through the interview. Do you remember? He kept saying how tough it was. Against us, because we were a government with a proper strategy. That's what he meant. <laughs> so what I'm saying about this government, you, you were asking the question, how are we producing leaders like this? And I think part of the answer is a combination of a Tory party that's hollowed out, as you were saying earlier in the week about, you know, one nation Tories have been hollowed out. It's also the fact that social media has driven the debate into these kind of, you know, much more tribally polarized factions and tribes, if you like. But I wouldn't underestimate a dumbed down, very biased right wing media that is constantly telling the country that these people are better than they are. They are terrible, Rory. We now have both tr trust is a t she can't do this job. I've seen prime ministers, Rory. I know what it takes. She cannot do this job. Quasi quartet, but, 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 but will but, but, never be a but, chancellor. But, but as, as you're, you're talking to me as though I disagree with you, right? No, nobody really disagrees with you. That's the problem with this line. No, this is where the, you're the, wrong. The, there's, a few, there's a few lunatic correspondents in right wing newspapers that fewer and fewer people read in this country who are saying this stuff. But that's not the reason these people got these jobs. The reason these people got these jobs is, for, is, is the really weird question is why were they selected over Rishi Sunak? Rishi Sunak spent months explaining in real detail why what Liz Truss was proposing to do would be catastrophic, would lead to a run on sterling, would lead to inflation. Mm. And it's something about the mindset of, particularly in that case, 80,000 voters in the Conservative Party that somehow wanted these sound bites from Liz Truss and didn't want arguments out of Rishi Sunak. But this is part of this goes back to my point about dumbing down and making people think that everything's very simple. And if you have a good slogan, that's all you need. And that is what is driving clever people away from politics as well. And I look, I really, you know, I, I don't want to go on about your school because I'm probably going about it too much. But I do think I remember Ricky Gervais said, when are we going to learn that the phrase old Etonian should qualify you for absolutely nothing? Quasi Quarteng. I think people assume there is an intelligence there because of his background. And this thing, he wrote a PhD about, he goes on about, he got a PhD in economics. It was about, it was about the workings of currency in the 17th century. 
I mean, you know, go and get a few old books. You can do that. He's not clever. You Alistair, need clever he, Alistair, people. I, Alistair, I, no, Alistair, I don't think that. I think that's the wrong way of looking. I think he's not wise. I think he doesn't listen. You he said he was weird ex- yesterday. You said he was weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's an exception. Why have we got a weirdo as chancellor? With a lot of weirdos as politicians, I can assure you, a lot of weirdos out there. Gordon Brown was was you know occasionally not always complete. Gordon normal. Brown is, is was and is an intellectual giant. I, I'm I'm happy to accept he's clever. Doesn't mean he's not occasionally a bit weird. Um, I I think the. Quasi court. I think it's important not to confuse what his problem is. His problem is not that he hasn't got an enormous IQ. I bet if you sat him down for an IQ test, he's off the charts. The guy gets his first at Trinity Cambridge. He wins University Challenge twice. That's not the problem with him. The problem with him is he doesn't listen to people. The problem with him is he doesn't have wisdom. He doesn't have humility. No, he's arrogant. He's arrogant. Yeah. But yeah. And Liz Truss went to a comprehensive school and is yeah. even worse than Quasi Courting. Yeah, okay. and it's even worse than quasi courting. So the idea that this is all down to an Etonian conspiracy is missing. Point. We've got a comprehensive educated prime minister who's a disaster. Rory, you are, in my view, confusing educated and clever. I do not think quasi courting is clever. If you were clever, you would not do what he did last week. You just wouldn't do it. And what's more, where you're right is about the arrogance. We're now hearing that there were people, including MPs, including ministers, including the advisors, who warned him this will send the pound tanking. Now, by the way, we put out a thing for questions this morning. We had hundreds of them. One of them said, why is was Robert Maxwell considered a criminal for destroying our pensions pot, mine included because I was on the mirror? This lot are destroying our pensions. This lot are destroying our mortgages. Have you seen, have you seen the figures on mortgages and these, these mortgage deals that are just collapsing as a direct consequence of a government decision? This lot should be in jail. On, on most of the stuff, we violently <laughs> agree, and I think we should take a break. <laughs> Welcome back. A special episode of The Rest is Politics with me, Alistair Campbell. And with me, Rory Stewart. So somewhere in the general mess and rage um, about what's happening is the question about what's happened to the British economy and how quasi Quarting's action triggered this amazing market collapse and why everybody around the world is so so frightened about it. And I guess the, the first thing that's strange about it is that 90% of the decisions that he made had already been signaled long in advance. The uh, attempt to do an energy price cap, the reversal of certain kinds of taxes, national insurance, corporation tax. The only really new thing that surprised people was dropping the top rate of tax. And that actually is a few billions out of a package which is nearly 100 times larger. So why did it have this consequence? And I think if you look at the very, very strong response you're getting out of American economists, Larry Summers, Paul Krugman, and others, it's because they are very worried about what this suggests, not just about the fragility of the British economy, but about the fragility of the European and American economies as well. Mm. Because somewhere in the background is this extraordinary story since 2008 of quantitative easing, basically printing an enormous amount of money, huge rises in public expenditure, which everybody Mm. thought was going to cause inflation or people traditionally would have predicted would cause inflation, but didn't. So we had this very strange time from 2008 to 2022. And, you know, these, the most, one of the most famous investors talking about British guilt, which is what we're just going to talk about, said at the time that gilts are sitting on a bed of nitroglycerine. So the idea was everybody's been expecting this to blow up for the last 12 years, 14 years, and it's finally blown up. Um, And one of the things I guess that's frightening European policymakers and American policymakers is do they have similar kinds of vulnerabilities? Because of course, Europe is also having to spend an incredible amount on its energy bills. The US has also got the same problem of having an enormous amount of foreign money swelling around that can leave very quickly. Mm. And somehow Quasi Quarteng, who has been deeply disrespectful towards all economic consensus and reckless, but what he's done is, with a relatively small move, blow up a system which could blow up elsewhere. By the way, Rory, talking of Quasi Quarteng, Kami Quasi, I... As you know, I have some connections with some Conservative MPs, and I spoke to two of them yesterday who were on his call. He did a sort of rather panicky phone call with Tory backbenchers. And there were about 80 backbenchers on there talking to him. And 
he did his thing, which you you were trying to defend when uh, when he was doing it at the Queen's funeral, sort of you know laughing and joking about things. He did actually sort of put out a, a message to them, you know, if, basically if you've got any ideas about how I can steady the ship, then let me know to Tory backbenchers. Um, and he was getting a lot of heat, um, but he was not conceding on the principle that he was that this budget, mini budget, mega mini budget, was in any way the wrong course to take. Now, I think a lot of those MPs, certainly the two that I spoke to, uh, basically are not going to be able to back this when it comes before the House of Commons. Well, one, one of the interesting things, Alistair, which I think is at the heart of this, is do you think those MPs really understand any of this stuff? Because no. certainly many of the colleagues I had in the House of Commons simply don't understand this level of economics. If I actually asked them what a guilt was, mm. they wouldn't know what a guilt was. I mean, a guilt, obviously, for listeners of the rest of politics, podcast is a is the equivalent of a US a US Treasury. It's it's the government bonds that we issue. It's called a gilt because in the olden days it had a little gold thing around the it was literally a piece of paper and it was it had a gold thing on it. One hundred percent. Now one of the things that's weird about it is that w- the government issues these things and it can't really default on them because mm. they're issued in pounds so they can just basically print more pounds in order to pay you off at the end of your period. But what everybody is really worried about, I guess, is inflation. And maybe this brings us into why people were selling gilts, why they were running away, why we almost collapsed the pension system in Britain, and why people are very worried about mortgages. Because the bottom of the whole thing is what we used to call politely last year, the cost of living crisis, but is basically just another word for runaway inflation. That's what people mm. are worried about. Mm. Yeah. By the way, um, Paul Kelso, who works for Sky, he did a very, very, very good explainer yesterday about bonds and gilts. It was really good. It was about four minutes, uh, and I think he posted it on his Twitter feed. But it was—I saw it on Sky, and uh, it's worth a look because I—I I do think we, you know, we, we use these terms as though there's a sort of universal understanding of what it means and and, and the impact of it. But look, you you, you mentioned their uh, pensions. Um, the other thing I think is really, really important in the last twenty-four hours, I've. Just walking around where I live in North London, I have talked to two small businesses who say they're very close to packing up. And the, and the tipping point for one of them was the electricity and gas bills that he just had in. Another one was labor shortages. It's a restaurant where he says he just cannot get the staff at the moment. Uh, and he, he, the other thing he said was that he's actually having to close down for part of the week because the staff who who are willing to work are in such a strong position now that they're basing, basically setting the terms of when they turn up to work. And then the other thing is this sense of, uh, we're back to the point about confidence. The third guy just said he feels everything is going so badly wrong that he might as well get out now. Now, yeah. once, that, once that becomes catching, I, I promise you, Rory, when you do catch up with Liz Truss's media around this morning, she will have exacerbated rather than eased that feeling and that mood. Yeah. And it's all about confidence, isn't it? And when panic sets into markets, as we all know, we all start panicking. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get a mortgage at the moment, and uh, <laughs> I haven't heard back from the bank. <laughs> I'm pretty terrified. Where, where's this for? In, in... It's, I, I'm, I'm uh, trying to buy a house in Scotland. You've got a house in Scotland. <laughs> How many houses do you want in Scotland? <laughs> well, Scotland's a very nice place. It, very, it really is. It really is. But the point, point is on mortgages, though. I mean, obviously, I'm in a fortunate position. Um, but I'm just touching the edge of the, the reality, which is a lot of banks simply don't want to talk to you at the moment. Mm. They've no idea what price to charge you on a fixed rate mortgage. And all the other things that you're hoping in your life are going to come together all go wrong at the same time. Faisal Islam, BB, BBC, uh, he tweeted this morning, since the mini budget on Friday, 1,621 residential mortgage deals have been pulled from sale. That's a 41% fall. A further 321 products were withdrawn yesterday on top of a record 935 products withdrawn the day before. So, so does it sound like I'm going to get a mortgage, Elster? Well, I think you <laughs> might because, you know, you're... But no, but that, 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 just imagine the number of people and families for whom that represents absolute panic. No, it's, it's terrifying. And it's, it's totally self inflicted And it's terrifying. And it, and it affects everybody because, of course, it affects the buyer, but it also affects the seller. Absolutely, absolutely. And then I think we've seen it, we're, we're seeing a 20%. And I've, I've never quite understood the, the sort of, you know, fixation in British life on, on rising house prices. But we're, we're now seeing 20% fall. So on every level, 
And of course, to hear Trust today and Kwarteng apparently on this call as well, basically saying, well, you know, we've got to pin it all on Ukraine. This was happening before Ukraine. Ukraine has exacerbated part of this. But the really big shock, I think, for people is that they've the Tory party has foisted upon us a prime minister and now who has appointed a chancellor. And they, in their ideology, as you described it the other day, have crashed the economy. And that is unforgivable. Unforgivable. I also think, unfortunately, this is going to drive more uncertainty, more populism, because what it's exposed is the incredible fragility of our entire, as it were, capitalist system. And without sounding too much like Jeremy Corbyn, something very, very fragile and weird and unpredictable is out there. And it's been weird since the 2008 financial crisis. We're struggling possibly with things like secular stagnation. Mm -hmm. And there are underlying problems that we're dealing with, which, you know, one of the reasons I've been saying we're going into a 10-year recession, and I think we're going into it sooner than we thought, is that our populations are aging all over Europe and even in the United States now. People don't want immigration coming in. That causes all those problems you were talking about with your friend not being able to get staff in his restaurant. Mm. Climate change is going to impose additional costs, wipe out additional communities. We're learning, trying to cover the cost of energy bills, that putting the cost of carbon on people's energy bills isn't going to work because low-income households will literally go bankrupt if you try to do that. Mm. Put all of this together, I think the situation is very, very, very gloomy. Do you, do you envisage a situation in which, I mean, Johnson went in three years. Do you think Truss can actually survive as prime minister up to an election? I think it's very difficult. I think um, very, very difficult indeed. And, and, do you and, think, and do you think if, she, if the Tories do get rid of her, do you think they think they can foist another prime minister upon us with another ridiculous leadership election? Because that would be the only time, the, the only time that there'd been, you had Baldwin followed by Chamberlain, followed by Churchill. Now, that was, they were very, very special circumstances. Um, but can you imagine a situation in which Johnson goes for being a liar and a lawbreaker, Trust goes because it's seen that she's utterly incompetent and totally out of her depth, and then somebody else comes in? And Johnson, doubtless, is sitting there thinking, ah, they're going to very quickly realise that I'm the guy they need back. It's, it, and presumably Rishi Sunak will also think that people are going to concentrate on the fact that he called all this before it happened. Um, mm. I, I think the Conservative Party is deeply, deeply damaged. And there's almost a sort of psychological sense of self-harm here. The appointment of Liz Truss, the decision of Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng to do this seems so bizarre that you almost get the sense that these parties have a, a natural lifestime, lifespan in office. And by the end, they just start doing crazy stuff. You remember the end of the John Major government where they just started producing all these completely weird, unnecessary scandals as though the party just was eating itself from the inside. Mm. Do you, let, let, let's then talk about the second part of this week, which I introduced at the top, uh, Keir Starmer's speech to conference, which, and the Labour Party conference, I've just actually been reading the Zoot Deutsche Zeitung, as I do, and they have a, a big piece about Keir Starmer having had a very, very good week, and I think a lot of our media said that. Um, what was your sense of for, from Amman? I know it's difficult sometimes to get a flavour, but what was your sense of? of well, I content? think I think he has. I think he has come through. I mean, he's been handed an extraordinary gift in a sense, which is that he's up against this completely calamitous government. But he has now got the biggest poll lead ahead of the Tories since two thousand and one. Mm -hmm. Right, he's further ahead than than you guys were in two thousand two, two thousand three, four, five. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the top rate of tax cut has been imposed by 69% of those who backed the Conservatives in 2019. I, I do think this point about confidence is important. And I, and I felt about, look, Keir's never going to be a Barack Obama orator. He's never going to be, you know, Merkel, although he's probably more Merkel than he is Obama. But I'll tell you what I think he does have. I think, and I think this is getting through. He's a decent person. He's a human being. I think he works incredibly hard. He's done really serious jobs all his life. He's a serious person in a way that Johnson wasn't. And, I, and I'm afraid I don't think Truss is, because if you're a serious person, you don't do what she did this morning. And I'll tell you the other thing that I think is, is important about, about Keir. He's very calm. And I've noticed that when he's been getting a lot of flack from the Corbynites and sometimes from people like me for not being strong enough on Brexit, not being aggressive, not, not having enough oomph and all the other things I sometimes say on here. He's just very, very calm and very, very steady. 
and I, I just got the feeling that what happened this week because you do, you also need luck in politics. And as you say, this kind of fell into his lap at the right time. Labour Party conference going on, but how you use your luck is a very, very, very important thing in politics. And I, I just had a sense that I really did have a sense this week, possibly for the first time, that Labour can actually win. Um, and once you get that psychology, it's very, very, it's powerful. I, I think they've got a very, very good chance of winning now. I think it's also true that our least favourite person in the world, Boris Johnson, was a very nimble, unusual communicator, which Liz Truss is not. Mm. And it was more difficult for Keir Starmer to make progress because Boris Johnson's particular capacity for bullshit and invention and wit did touch parts of the country that Liz Truss is completely struggling to touch. Mm, mm. People thought he was a kind of character related to that. Do you think, though, that what, I mean, what are the risks? What could go wrong? So they're leading at the moment 45% to 28%, largest lead that YouGov, for example, has ever recorded. Mm. So Labour looks like it's unstoppable at the moment. What could go wrong for them? If we, if we were doing this pod in two years' time and they're not the government, what would it be before? Oh, it would be... I mean, I think the, 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 he, Keir has tried to show that he's changed the party. I think what could go wrong is if people, those people in the centre who aren't that bothered about politics on a day-to-day -day basis, but they just had a sense about Labour moving far too, too far to the left. I think it, what could go wrong is if that wing of the party really started to give a sense of the party being, being very badly divided, as divided as the Tories. I think the other thing that could go wrong is and it's not really a question of what can go wrong, but I think that Keir, obviously Keir's got to be the front and the centre of this. But I think the the sense of the there has to be the sense of a strength and depth, and I think that comes through in all sorts of different ways. And the other thing I think the one bit I think is missing at the moment, which I hope he fills, is the sense of a of a I don't mean a big idea specifically in terms of a policy idea, but a big strategic message about the future. I still I still feel that Labour talks. Is trapped too much in talking about the past. So, for example, this week there was lots of focus about bringing Blairism back into the party. It's talking about the past. I'd like to hear a lot more about. To be fair, he did it with the green energy thing. I thought that was good, but you know, artificial intelligence and robotics and the yep. technological revolution. How we make that something that's fair. Um, but I think, look, that where he's struck, where he's in a good position here is that a lot of the the great thing about having negatives thrown at you is you can turn them into positives. So what have people been saying about the Labour Party? Don't know what they stand for. Keir, bit boring. Well, those two things can be changed very, very quickly. One, because he's not boring. He's actually quite an interesting guy. And I think once he's got this confidence thing going, I think we'll start to see that much more positively. Well, it's, when you say he's quite an interesting guy, I mean, I agree with you. He's a competent guy. He's a hardworking guy. He's a professional guy. And he'd probably do a better job as prime minister. But why do you think he's interesting? Because... Well, what I mean by that is that when I sit down and have a chat with him, I find it very interesting to talk to him because I think he thinks about things. I think he's got, he's got a, you know, I'm a great believer in, <laughs> in judging people by those that are close to them. He's got a very nice wife. He's got a very nice family. He's got good friends. I remember I went to the Arsenal Burnley game last year and we met up for a drink afterwards. I was really, you know, his friends that he went to the football with, they were the same people that he'd been going with for years and years and years. They came from different sorts of backgrounds. He's interested in their lives and you know, I think he's just got a, he, he's, he's got a very, very interesting backstory. Um, we talked yesterday, we talked earlier in the week about how he allowed himself to be defined as this Islington lawyer. He really came from a struggling past. And I think people find that interesting when they know about it. So I think he's somebody who I, I, I've, I've become more impressed by him, particularly in recent weeks and months. I like the fact as well that, for example, on the constitutional stuff, you and I have talked, we talked about this and we both disappointed that he didn't seem to have a sense of how we felt about how badly this is. So what's he done? He's outsourced it to Gordon Brown. Gordon Brown's going to come up with a big report. I'm actually quite excited about some of the things he's going to have in there. Yeah. Yeah. He's also good at football, Rory, which is very, very important. He knows a lot about football. Is he an Arsenal yeah. fan? Is that why he was at the Arsenal Burnley game? He's an Arsenal fan. He's an Arsenal fan and he's also, he plays, I think he plays six aside football every week. He's right. still quite fit. Yeah. Very good. So yeah. Alan Lockie, who's his new speechwriter, if people are interested in getting into it, has written a piece which he wrote a year ago on, on medium.com and where he talked about the kind of speech that he thought Keir Sama should write. And actually it's to 
Keir Starmer's credit, it's quite a critical speech that this guy read a year ago saying, if I had been writing the Labour Party conference speech, this is what Keir Starmer should have done. This is why I'm disappointed by Keir Starmer. And Keir Starmer's rewarded him by making him a speechwriter. And Alan Lockie pulled it out by delivering quite a good speech for him. I always think it's a dangerous thing for people to think that politicians don't write their own speeches. <laughs> and, and that's the other thing. But when I talked about the confidence, though, no, obviously, I mean, I can remember well, read my diaries. I mean, some of Tony Blair's speech processes were absolute nightmare for those of us who were drafting them. But ultimately, the leader and the politician has to own that speech 100%. But I did think, look, I did think it was a better speech. I also thought his delivery has improved a lot. Um, and I think, it, you know, he's, uh, yeah, I, I, that's, I do think these two things coming together this week are very, very, very significant. And I think he's, uh, I think one thing that he needs to do is we've got to avoid the problem that Italy's got into where basically they convinced themselves that none of the political parties had an answer to the economy. The answer, the reason why Giorgio Maloney came through Mm. is the consensus is that nobody has any idea what to do. And of course, it's true to some extent that the problems of the global economy, I believe, are now so deep, so structural that the reality is that almost any party is going to struggle. Now, mm. you can make it much worse. Kwasi Kwarteng just made it much worse and he tripped it over the edge. But to some extent, what I think he did was a sort of straw on the camel's back situation. Mm. 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 And and I think the, the, the challenge for Keir is how does he prove that he's able to reassure people that he gets these guilts, he gets what's happening in global currency trading, he understands what the problems are with British immigration energy, and that under him, some kind of confidence can be restored. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And, but I'll tell you the, the, the other thing, last time I saw him, um, as it were, face to face, apart from when we did the podcast, I remember him talking about, he just, he'd actually fallen in love just being to Burnley. And he was talking about a visit that he did there. And he'd been to Scotland. I think it was in Scotland. And he was talking about this wind farm. And he sort of came alive talking about what we could do if we were able to get this. I can't remember the exact facts, but he was basically saying that this whole wind, form, wind farm was, was, was being run by stuff that had been constructed. Yeah, we, we got quite a lot of that places. when we interviewed him, didn't we? We that's right. Did he talk about that on the yeah, podcast? Yeah, he, yeah, he did. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 yeah. And, no, I, and I, th I think that that's, you know, I, when people sort of, so you, on, one, on the one level, you could say, oh, God, he's droning on about wind farms. But once people start to think this guy could be the next prime minister, they start to think, oh, he's explaining to me how the modern economy might have to work. And I, th do you know one thing that I think, we, this goes back to our point about the sort of dumbed down world in which we're living. I think a big piece that's been lost from our political debate here. Um, definitely when Trump was president in America, definitely in Italy with Berlusconi and that whole era. I think the whole thing of the role of politicians as educators about the real state of the world, I think that bit has been lost and we've got to get that back because that is one of the reasons. But boy, is it unpopular. Boy, boy are politicians not rewarded for telling the truth. No, Rory, why do you think this podcast gets as many listeners as it does? I think one of the reasons is that actually, without talking down to people, we kind of dig into things and we try. The number of people, you won't get as this as much as I do because you're in Jordan. But even this morning, two people, as I came out of the swimming pool this morning, one of them a journalist or a former journalist, one of them who said that he worked in, in banking, and they both said that they, they listened to the podcast because they found that we could explain things about what was going on in the world in a way that they found digestible. So I think that thing about, I don't mean educating in a sort of patronizing way. I mean, just informing people about the real state of the world, as opposed to the fantasy world that the Tories have talked talk to us about for the last, well, certainly since Johnson, and, and I would argue since Brexit. Brexit's going very well, apparently, Rory. Going very, very well indeed. Okay. Thank you, Alistair, very much. I think we're done for our special episode today. Goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. And hopefully fairly soon, goodbye from Liz Trust and Kwasi Kwarteng. 